it's a pleasure to see you all. We're very happy to be here hosting the second session of our seminar series, Topics in Early Modern Studies. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd first like to give you the house rules. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. After the presentation, we'll have time for questions. I would ask you to either write your questions in the chat or use the raise your hand function to let us know that you'd like to speak, which, whichever you feel most comfortable with. When writing in the chat, please feel free to make your questions either in English, Portuguese, Spanish or French. Finally, I'd also like to remind you that this session is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube channel later on. Having that said, we're happy to welcome today Professor André de Mello Araújo. Professor André obtained his PhD at the University of Witten, Hederke in Germany in 2011, pardon my German, and has been an assistant professor in early modern history at the University of Brasilia since 2012. He's also the leader of the research group Metamorphose, Materiality and Interpretation of Early Modern Printed Books and Manuscripts, registered at the National Council for Scientific and Technological Development in Brazil. He has a very rich variety of published works, both in German and in Portuguese, on topics such as early modern prints and the German Enlightenment, to cite but a few. Amongst his latest publications is the article about diplomatics in the Encyclopedia of Early Modern History, edited by Brill. His research interests include the history of the book and early modern German historiography. Today, he will present a paper entitled The Book and the Copy, or Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Early Prints But Were Afraid to Ask, which we're all very excited to hear. So thank you, Professor André for accepting our invitation and the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for your generous introduction and for inviting me to take part in this seminar series. As I said, I'm in Germany now where I've uh, just started a new research project on diplomatics in 18th century Germany from the perspective of the history of knowledge. But since this project is still at the very beginning, I propose to the conveners of this similar series that I'd rather share with you an explorative study of one particular item that belongs to the collection of rare book of housed at my university libraries in Brasilia that I also use for teaching purposes. I hope that this will give you an opportunity to start a discussion on both teaching and research strategies when dealing with printed sources from the early modern period, as well as a chance to exchange knowledge on this topic by asking everything we always wanted to know about old prints, but were afraid to ask to each other. So having this in mind, I'm going to share with you my screen, which I hope it works. Do you already see my screen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's working, Professor. So just put it in the presentation modus. Is it working now? Uh, no, no. I think right you should. Yeah. Now, is it working? No. I think you stopped sharing your screen. Yeah. I'm sorry. I think so it, you back. need to try it again. And what about now? Yeah, no, it's Are you seeing the full screen? Yes. Great. So until a couple of days ago, if we accessed University of Brasilia Library's online catalog and searched for Hippocrates' medical treatises, that is to say, a collection of works transmitted under the name of Hippocrates, we would have come up to an edition printed in Basel in 1538. As we will see in my talk today, there was indeed a very important edition of Hippocrates' works printed in Basel in 1538, but not by the printer Andreas Cratander. 
Well, apart from the records of the catalog, which dates back to 1983, it happens that history of this strange record has a second and far more recent chapter. In August 2019, some of my undergraduate students, together with two extraordinary librarians and myself, were analyzing and redescribing our early modern book collection. The students produced the record that I am sharing with you, to some which corrections and new comments were made. As you can see, it's once more the bibliographical record of a book printed in Basel in 1538 by Andreas Kratander. But once more, something was clearly going wrong here. And my question was, how was this possible? In other words, what was going on on this printed page so that the record of a misleading information went unnoticed for so many years and for so many times? This question invited me to delve into the history of early modern book. The coming out of my investigation was far from as spectacular as Nick Wilding's analysis of, in his words, this very strange copy of Galileo's 1610 Siderius Nuncius. By closing examining evidence from the artifact itself, Nick Wilding concluded that this copy of an early 17th century book was a forgery, a product of organized crime. And this was not just the case of the copy he analyzed. As reported two days ago on the paper El Pais, the authentic copy of Galileo's Siderius Nuncius, once housed at the National Library of Spain, was stolen and replaced by another forgery. The police have been secretly investigated in theft since 2018. But it's certainly not the case of the Hippocratic works housed at the University of Brasilia Central Library. The book is not as rare and as valuable as Galileo's Siderius Nuncius, and our copy is not a forgery. Yet, when analyzed as a handmade artifact, the copy housed at my university's library of a book printed in the 16th century Basel opened up a window, first, to investigate the relationship between the agents involved in producing a book in the hand press period, second, as Marco Suarez would say, to understand how this particular copy came to be the way it is, and third, to comprehend how the graphical elements of an early modern printed artifact are connected to the history of culture, knowledge, work, and trade. At a first glance, the title page of our Renaissance edition of a group of medical treatises connected to the name of Hippocrates had no reason to raise suspicion. The date of 1538 is visible on handmade paper from the period, yet the colophon states that the work was brought to the press in the year 1526, what would make from this book an older item from our university collection than the letters of Pliny the Younger, printed 1533 and also housed at the Brazilian Library. But how to explain the contradiction between the dates shown on the first and the last pages of the very same title? What relations can be established between the information recorded on paper and the history of production, trade, use, and preservation of this particular artifact? So let me please start by looking at the importance that the years 1526 and 1538 have for the establishment and diffusion of the Hippocratic corpus within Renaissance scholars. It's well known that these medical treatises enjoyed a revival in early 16th century Europe, and this could happen due to the work of the press, which expanded the Hippocratic works both in number of available copies as well as in length when comparing the 16th century printed editions to the medieval manuscripts. So the first printed edition of the Hippocratic works was a translation into Latin prepared in Rome by Marcus Fabius Calvus and dated from 1525, which was immediately followed in the next year by the first edition printed in Greek 
by the well-known Venetian printer Aldous Manusius. The Aldine edition is therefore the princeps edition of the Greek text. Apart from Venice, some major centers dominated the highly competitive printing business in Europe in the 16th century, such as Basel, Paris, and Lyon. The products of the presses in these centers had many points of contact, as I will show by analyzing the first editions of the Hippocratic Corpus. After coming out in Latin in Rome and in Greek in Venice, these treatises were printed in Basel on the print shop of Andreas Cratander, based on the Latin first established edition in Rome by Colvos. It turned out that the errors introduced by Colvos in the Latin text were partially reproduced in Cratander's edition and were immediately spotted out by some readers. In order to avoid new mistakes, the humanist Janus Cornarius prepared a revised edition of the Greek text published in Venice by Aldous Manusius. This new edition was printed in Basel at the printing house of the Frobens family in 1538. We can say that up to a certain extent that Hieronymus Froben, the eldest son of the famous Johann Froben, was competing both with the Venetian Greek edition as well as the Latin edition already produced in the local market. The year 1538 is therefore a landmark for the humanist diffusion of the Hippocratic Corpus, and I'm inclined to think that that's the reason why this year figures out on the title page of the Brazilian copy of Catrandra's edition. Let me make me clear. I'm not suggesting that Cratander printed his Latin edition of the Hippocratic Corpus in 1538, but I do think that Froben's enterprise at this year explains the misleading information registered on the title page of the copy housed at the University of Brasilia. Having this in mind, we should have a look not only at the title page and at the colophon, but also at the many other pages of this work. By looking at them, we should ask, are they compatible to the other extant copies of the Cotander edition? When looking at early modern printed artifacts, we must take into consideration that books produced in the hand press period were subject to revealing errors. Even the most carried editions, such as those valued by the Renaissance humanistic circles, were subject to some variations typical of handmade artifacts. In this sense, the hands of the composer responsible for setting the type in Kachander's printing house made a mistake. All the copies that I could examine from this work that came out from Kachander's press in 1526 display the number 219 in the upper right corner of the page 223. This is also the case of the copy preserved in Brasilia. The uniformity of the manual error in all the copies that I could examine becomes a first sign of documentary authenticity. So far, we know that at least the choirs within the main text of this book correspond to the Latin edition of Hippocrates' work printed by Cratander in Basel in 1526. This leads me to my second and equally important argument. The printing press reproduced not only errors, but also patterns. And I'm going to explore them by taking into consideration two graphical elements, the first printed and the second not printed on the title page. These elements are first, the border frames, and second, the blank space between the letters. In a highly competitive market for printed books, as it was the case of early 16th century Basel, the graphical quality of the products of the press matters a lot. This idea was explored more recently by Valentina Sebastiani when analyzing the works produced at Johannes Froben's print shop. 
And it was not different in the case of the Hippocratic corpus printed in Greek and Latin by Froben Sands and Cratander, respectively. So if you have a lock on the border frames used at Cratander's print shop in 1526, and also look at the product of other presses at the same period, we will see how the very same cut can be found, for instance, in the geography of Strabo, published three years earlier. These two title pages share more than border frames. They follow a similar graphical and typographical pattern. The geography of Strabo was printed in Basel in 1523 by Valentin Cudio, who had learned the art of printing from Cratander and opened his own workshop in 1522. Later on, the disputes between Curio and Cratander intensified due to the publication by both presses of a Greek dictionary, originally published by Aldous Manusius in Venice and expanded by some humanist quills in the city of Basel. In this competitive environment, the artist Hans Holbein, the younger, worked for the presses of Cratander and Curio, as well as for the presses of Johann Froben and Johann Bibel. From the summer 1522, Jakob Faber cut on metal Holbein's drawings, which were frequently used in many printing houses in Basel, such as those of Cratander, Curio, Froben, and Bibel. In both title pages that you can see now, the monogram IF stands for Jakob Faber. But in addition to having already been used at Curio's press, the same border frames were also printed on the title page of another Latin title published in Basel in 1526 by Johann Bibel. That's to say, the very same year that Cratander printed his Latin edition of the Hippocratic Corpus. The metal cut moved therefore from one printer to another. And this story has a previous chapter. As a matter of fact, this metal cut reconfigured another title page border frame by Holbein with Greek and Latin classical elf authors, which was largely used in Froben's print shop mainly to illustrate Erasmus' work between February 1515 and January 1523. In 1523, as we already know, the reconfigured version of this image was used for the first time, as far as I know, at the print shop of Valentin Curio. Still, by looking at many different title pages from the period, I could also find out that this new metal cut used by Cratander and many other printers in Basel between 1523 and 1526 was in a printing house in Lyon in 1538. You can see here the metal cut in a French title page. This finding make the use of the border frame in Basel in 1538 very improbable. Actually, it was not uncommon that cuts, initials, and border frames went through different printing houses in the hand press period. In Basel, even types went from print shops to print shops. In a recent paper published by Barbara Fox and Philip Palmer, the authors show that the German edition of Thomas Murrow's Utopia, printed 1524 by Johann Bibel, reuses the Utopian types from the Latin edition of 1518, printed by Johann Froben. Bibel was a journeyman in Froben's print shop, and as we already know, used in 1526 the very same border frame that Cratander used in his edition published in, also in 1526 of the Hippocratic Corpus. The close connections between printing houses in the 16th century 
resulted into recurring patterns. In other words, the printing press reproduced collectively established patterns. So let's keep this idea in mind and have a second look on some of the title page that we saw until now. In the title page printed by Froben in 1518 and 1523, as well as in the title page printed by Curio in 1523, we can see that the years were composed according to the Roman numeral system. This was also a pattern followed by many composers in different printing houses in the Han Press period, as it's also the case of Catander's 1526 edition of the Hippocratic Corpus. Therefore, I'd like to turn our attention now not just to the noticeable patterns within the printed area, but also and foremost to the patterns followed by early modern composers when typesetting the non-printed area of a tiled page. In one word, I'm talking about the use of blank spaces. In the hand press period, metal types were picked from the composer from a type case, preferably with the right hand and set into a composing stick, as you can see in these engravings taken from Joseph Moxon's Doctrine of the Handworks Applied to the Art of Printing, published in 1683. Individual sorts were picked up with the hand, including metal squares without any symbol or letter that were set between the words of a sentence, for example. So when looking at a composing stick from a material perspective, the spaces between the words are never an empty space. It means that the space were set in the composer's stakes just as letters were. As such, they also followed a typographical tradition. That is to say, they followed collective established patterns. This could been recognized in many works printed in Basel in the first half of the 16th century, as we saw before. In all these title pages, the composers introduced some spaces between the representations of the thousands and the hundreds in the Roman numeral systems of the year at the one side, here signed in green. And as it's also the case between the hundreds and the tens together with the units on the other side, once more highlighted in green. Therefore, we can also expect to find a similar pattern of spacing on the title page of Cretander's edition of the Hippocratic Corpus. By comparing the title page of the copy house at the University of Brasilia with several other extant copies of the same title, like this one preserved at the University of Michigan, we can easily recognize this pattern when setting Roman numerals on the page. If we line up the letters that can be found on the title page of both copies, it becomes clear that the additional Roman numerals needed to change the date from 1526 to 1538, in this case, a letter X and two letters I occupy exactly the unprinted area of the page. And these new letters represented the new numbers were not printed but drawn. This can be recognized by means of three main characteristics. First, the slight difference in the graphic form of the printed and the drawn letters. I hope you can recognize here the different sizes and angles of the drawn letter on the left that should be very much alike the printed ones, but it's not. Second, the lack of regularity in the alignment and in the distance between the new letters I. Here, you can see that the first I is intentionally closer to the letter already printed in order to cover the area of a printed full stop. This overlap can be seen when analyzing the paper with transmitted light, what leads me to a third point, namely, how late paper absorbs differently water base and oil-based ink. I hope we can easily spot this difference now by having a closer look at this area of the title page with transmitted light and under a microscope. The red arrows show the printed letters 
where the blue ones point out the drawn letters on the page. Here, you can also see a close-up on the drawn letters that change the year from 1526 to 1538. Now, I think we can easily understand why the first drawn I was placed exactly on this area, since it had to overlap the printed full stop. The highlighted area sign in red was printed, whereas the area sign in yellow was drawn over the printed full stop. Here, I'd like to make a very short and introductory remark on printing processes and the use of water-based and oil-based ink in the early modern period. This might be well known to many of you, but I'd really like to make this point clear. An image of a letter printed in relief, and what I'm saying applies for woodcuts, metal cuts, and types, can be recognized by looking at the bite of the type and how the ink is spread and absorbed on late paper. In short, in a printing house, cuts and types were inked frequently at the same time using ink balls by means of which the pressman could get the amount and the stiff consistency of the ink right. This was very important to allow both sides of a sheet of paper to be printed and was achieved by the 1520s using an oil-based ink which wouldn't easily flow into the hollows, either of the types or of the blocks, or even be deeply absorbed by the paper, like a water-based ink would normally do, as you can see in this handwritten note on an early 17th pilot page. It happens that due to the pressure of the press during the printing process and the characteristics of early modern handmade paper, the raised parts of the types or blocks produce deep areas on the paper, which can be frequently seen on the other side of the printed sheet. I hope you can recognize this effect in the second image of this slide. The third and the fourth images illustrate how the thick inks get sometimes accumulated at the very limit of the raised surface of a block. Coming back to my example, we should notice that this effect is noticeable only in the Roman numerals printed in Cassandra's workshop in 1526 and not in the letters added by hand on a later point. To sum up, the date registered in the title page of this copy of a book produced in Cassandra's print shop in 1526 was partially drawn with water-based ink. But why does this case matter for the historical research? And how far is it enlightening also as a teaching strategy for, for example, another, uh, an, an undergraduate course on early modern history? As I said at the beginning of my talk, the coming out of this close analysis is neither as spectacular as the discovery of a forgery, nor as the discovery of a lost or even an extremely rare book. Copies of Catandra's 1526 edition of the Hippocratic Corpus can be found in many library collections. And understanding what was going on at the title page of the copy house at the University of Brazil was quite simple. However, this copy invited me to delve into the history of the 16th century book. So I think it could be a very useful exercise when investigating early modern printed artifacts as well as when teaching with them to ask, what kind of information is more or less available to the eyes? What kind of evidence are they? On the one hand, we know that this particular copy was bought in Paris by the Brazilian physician and book collector Pedro Nava in 1961. The University of Brasilia acquired part of this book collection in 1983, since when his copy, this copy of Hippocratic works was wrongly catalogued. The provenance records are patchy, what makes it even more difficult to ascertain on which circumstances the date was altered on the title page. But on the other hand, at the time Cretander printed this copy, there were dozens of printing shops competing to each other in Basel. Paper sheets, ink, type, as well as correctors, typesetters, and pressmen 
circulated among them, creating collective established graphical patterns that were reproduced on the page. Not surprisingly, there were many tensions amongst, between the, amongst the printers of Basel who not only reproduced these graphical patterns, but also reprinted each other's book. This competitive, as well as collaborative in market, set the stage for the first printer's statute I've heard of, which dates back to 1531, and by means of which the activity of the craftsmen working in the printing trade was partially regulated. According to the new regulation, I quote, henceforth, no printer, neither by himself, nor by the mediation of others, may try to persuade another printer's employees, no matter whether these being correctors, typesetters, pressmen, or others, to leave their employer and come to work for him instead." End quote. What circulated between printing houses was not only metal types and border frames, but also typesetters and pressmen. And what fostered the creation of the Statute of Basel was a lawsuit against Andreas Cortander. What I want to convey is that the reasons for this lawsuit, as well as its evidences, can be found not only in this handwritten record, but also and foremost on the many printed books made in Cortander's and his contemporaries' printing houses themselves. That's why the idea at the heart of my explorative study is to make students and researchers more committed to observe and analyze historical records, not only as texts, but also as artifacts, as evidence of human lives, as material testimonies of a social history of culture, knowledge, work, and trade. Thank you. <laughs>